Greetings. Modeling refers to the process of creating a spatial array of estimations. The parameter that is being estimated may be the ground surface elevation, subsurface structural contacts, the elevation at the top of an ore zone, the thickness of an ore, the grade of the ore, or some other property that is useful for the evaluation of the resource. These arrays may be two or three dimensional depending upon the number of independent variables. This concept, or at least the terminology of dimensionality, is problematic and at first glance counterintuitive. So let's define this nomenclature. One dimensional data refers to data that has one independent variable and one dependent variable. For example, if we're sampling water levels at a given well over time, we can think of the date as the independent variable and the water level as the dependent variable. For any given time, there can be one and only one water level. This data can be modeled with a polynomial equation. It can be plotted as a two-dimensional graph or a pseudo three-dimensional diagram. Two-dimensional data refers to data that has two independent variables and one dependent variable. For example, consider a data set that consists of Eastings, Northings, and surface elevations. The Eastings and Northings are the independent variables, while elevation is the dependent variable. For any given XY coordinate, there can be one and only one Z value. Modeling two-dimensional data typically involves an imaginary grid in which a value is estimated at the center of each grid cell based on the surrounding control points. This grid is then color-coded in order to create a contour map. The grid may also be presented as a three-dimensional surface. Some call this a 2.5D model. Finally, we come to true 3D data, in which we typically have XYZ as our independent variables and a G or grade value as the dependent variable. This G value might represent geochemical, geophysical, or geotechnical values. Modeling 3D data typically involves the creation of a 3D block model, in which the cells or voxels are estimated by looking at the surrounding control points. 3D models can be displayed as two-dimensional contour maps that might show the average, lowest, highest, or sum of all the voxels below a given point, but more typically, 3D models are shown as three-dimensional block models or isosurfaces, which are essentially three-dimensional contours. Let's review two-dimensional modeling or gridding in more detail. We start with some control points, as shown by the diagram to the upper left. In this example, the goal is to create a sand thickness or isopack model. The values adjacent to the control points represent the thickness of sand encountered within a series of boreholes. The first step in the modeling process is to create an imaginary grid that overlays the project area. For each cell within this grid, we estimate a thickness by looking at the values of the surrounding control points and performing some sort of weighted average based on the distance from the cell midpoint or the node and the control points. This estimation process is called interpolation. The actual method that is used, and there are many, is called an algorithm. Now once all of the cell node values have been interpolated, we have a model. It's a numerical model, and it can be displayed, filtered, analyzed, and manipulated in a variety of ways. Here are three of the ways in which 2D grid models can be displayed or visualized. In the first example, the cells are color-coded based on their node values. By making the cells smaller and smoothing the edges, we get a color-coded contour map. Another method is to draw lines between cells that are different. Again, by making the cells smaller and smoothing the lines, we get a contour map. Finally, the cells can be plotted in three dimensions such that the height of the cell is proportional to the corresponding node value. A finely spaced grid gives a fishnet appearance. Note, this is a 3D display of a 2D model. It does not represent a 3D model. Two-dimensional grid models are great for modeling surface elevations, except in the case of overhangs. Remember, for each XY location, there can be one and only one surface elevation. Two-dimensional grid models are also perfectly suited for modeling subsurface structural elevations for layer cake geological environments. In this example, 
Each contact is modeled with the grid and stacked up to create a stratigraphic model. Two-dimensional grid models may also be used with other types of non-elevation slash structural data in which there is only one dependent variable, or Z, for any given XY location. In these examples, we're plotting Bouguer gravity anomalies and surface chemistry as contour maps. But, two-dimensional gridding falls apart when we start modeling data in which the dependent variable varies with elevation or depth. In this example, the dependent variable might represent contamination levels, precious metal concentrations, hydrocarbon levels, hydraulic conductivity, soil compaction, geothermal levels, and so on. These types of spatial data sets cannot, repeat, cannot be modeled with two-dimensional gridding methods. Instead, three-dimensional modeling must be employed when dealing with data that varies both vertically as well as horizontally. In this example, we're going to create a three-dimensional model. We start with some control points, as shown by the red dots. Typically, these control points represent measurements that were made from borehole samples, but they could just as well be salinity concentrations within a body of water or air pollution data within the atmosphere. The first step in the three-dimensional modeling process is to create an imaginary 3D grid that encompasses the study region. Each cell within this 3D matrix is referred to as a block or voxel. The midpoint of each voxel is referred to as a node. For each of these nodes, we estimate a value by looking at the surrounding control points and performing some sort of weighted average based on the distances between the node and the control points. The weighting given to these neighboring points may vary based on their relative directions as well as the relative horizontal and vertical distances. In other words, the modeling can be anisotropic meaning that the modeling may be biased to favor a given direction. As with the two-dimensional interpolation, these estimation methods are referred to as algorithms. Selecting the proper modeling technique, gridding or block modeling, as well as the algorithm, such as inverse distance weighting, triangulation, polynomial, trend surface, kriging, etc., represents the biggest hurdle for the novice user. If a layer of interest does not vary vertically, the geology can be effectively modeled by gridding the top and bottom of each stratigraphic unit. On the other hand, if a parameter such as grade, geochemistry, or porosity permeability varies vertically, then a block modeling method constrained by upper and lower grids, the top and base of the unit, should be used. For example, in economic geology, many types of geologic models consist of vertically variable resources that are sandwiched between two non-economic layers. In environmental geology, hydraulically conductive units with significant variations in vertical transmissivity are often bound above and below by relatively impermeable stratigraphic units. This hydraulic conductivity determines how, conduct, how contaminants will migrate through the subsurface. Here's a fairly busy chart that provides some modeling guidelines based on the vertical variability of the geologic, geophysical, geochemical, or geotechnical property that is being evaluated. The term grade is used to describe these properties in honor of the miners who originally came up with the concept of block modeling. Let's walk through the table. If you're just modeling gross stratigraphy, use two-dimensional gridding. If you're modeling a vertically variable parameter that is sandwiched between two homogeneous stratigraphic units, you'll need to use three-dimensional block modeling that is constrained by overlying and underlying two-dimensional grid models. If you're modeling a vertically variable parameter that is not sandwiched between anything, use 3D block isotropic modeling instead. If you're modeling a vertically variable parameter that is horizontally biased, as is often the case on planets with large gravitational fields, you should use a 3D block modeling algorithm that favors this horizontality. Finally, if you're dealing with quasi-layer deposits that abruptly change laterally, you may need to use a special 3D block modeling algorithm called litho-blending. In practice, 
Numerical models of many geological environments employ a combination of gridding and block modeling. For example, a deposit may have a discrete top and bottom, but the grade may vary vertically between these two surfaces, as shown by this hybrid model. In this example, the overburden and bedrock have been modeled with two-dimensional gridding techniques, whereas the relative calcium-magnesium content for a carbonate that is sandwiched between these two units was modeled with a three-dimensional block modeling method. Thanks for watching.